Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first discussion of The Judging Eye, which is the first book of the Aspect Emperor series by R. Scott Baker, or the fourth book in the second <laughs> apocalypse, as I prefer to think about it. Uh, yeah, today we're discussing chapters one to four, and next week we'll continue on um, to the next 100 pages, how many of our chapters that is, if you're reading along with us. Did we decide we didn't talk about this before we started recording? But I guess we'll go <laughs> up to chapter nine, probably. Um, sorry, we usually decide before we start recording. But yeah, up to chapter nine for next week. With me, the usual group of friends. Steve, would you like to start us off with introductions? Sure, I'm Steve. And part of my voice, my I'm thinking I might be losing it. But I'm, I'm happy to be here and happy to talk about the judging eye. I'm Carl, first time reader of this series, uh, and yeah, five, five through eight sounds good to me. And, uh, <laughs> I'm uh, Justin, and also first time reader of The Judging Act. Nice. Yeah. And uh, Justin, don't forget to plug your website and Carl, your book. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. Uh, you can find Truth of Crowns. Uh, just look up Truth of Crowns. I mean, I, I, I think you'll find it. That's what I did. So, <laughs> not too hard yeah yeah um and i i i yeah i sometimes write on midnightmovietrain.com hmm. nice i also looked it up i will oh. i had it pulled up and i was like scrolling through i was like ah oh, there we are um, yeah very nice <laughs> um yeah so we start 20 years in the future with a letter that kind of confirms what we suspected from one of the epigraphs that Akamian wrote that Kerlis is basically a tyrant now and is ruling with an iron fist and hates anyone who speaks against him and will destroy them. And there are judges who do so. So question for the group, what is the judging eye? Do we know yet? Oh, no, I, ju I, I just assume we'll figure that out as we as we go along. I, I, I haven't given that much thought, I'll be honest. <laughs> Uh, we don't know yet, but we'll find out. Okay, okay. I I thought we had a couple of possibilities. Maybe the judges with, uh, I don't know, who we haven't seen exactly what they do yet, but they're basically the truth police, I guess, of this world. <laughs> and uh, Mimara. Um, yeah. Yeah. Her vision in which she sees that Akamian's damned or she can see how pure or not someone is. I thought those, one of those might be related to the judging eye, but we will see. Speaking hey, can, of, can, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Can we start actually with the, uh, what came before, what has come before? Oh, which yeah. Is at the end of, I guess, <laughs> uh, at least the copies Justin and I have. Uh, mm -hmm. Because it is crazy, and it does, you know, talk. I mean, there wasn't a lot I would say that was new after reading the appendices of uh, the Thousandfold Thought, but it definitely was like it was interesting seeing it all laid out and like put so much more bluntly. I guess you could say the history and kind of the timeline and of everything. And um, it, it's also interesting because it's written with a very particular voice that made me wonder, you know, we, we speculated in our episode on the appendices, you know, is this written by a Camian? I think we kind of all agreed is that's what it seems like. Um, and so I was curious, you know, what sort of the, the point of view you could say of the, of what has come before, like what it is, because I don't know, it just had a really distinct voice to me. And so I wasn't sure if that was just Baker having fun with it, or if there is like, it too is sort of a meta document in a sense. Hmm. I don't know the answer to that, but there is something interesting here where it says that Kellis went mad. What he did not know, could not know, was that Kellis would see farther than him, that he would think beyond his thousandfold thought and go mad. So since this is this document is apparently a statement of facts, did Kellis in fact go mad? It was so interesting. Yeah, that, that, that was the thing that stood out to me the most, is that that was how it was referred to. Um, and part of the reason why I asked about like, you know, the point of view thing uh, is I was like, thinking, like, is this like a, a Dunyan scholar writing this, you know, in, in the future? I mean, I have no idea, you know, I'm just like completely spitballing here. 
But uh, yeah, it's interesting that it like explicitly calls Kallus mad for his visions, which, you know, again, sounds very objective for this like recap that I wasn't certain that, you know, I felt like it was very vague about how we should interpret Kallus's mental state at the end of the thousand fold thought. Um, so I, yeah, that was really interesting. Yeah, I completely agree. That was like, that was the bit that stuck out to me. <laughs> like a sore thumb and reading this what has come before just like that in that very authoritative voice where it wasn't I don't know it feels tonally maybe a little different than the uh, appendices or the glossary from a thousand the thousand fold thought like it feels very objective like authoritative like Kellis is mad but and and maybe that is the voice and maybe it's right or wrong you know who knows but <laughs> yeah there is something else in the in that section that before his death, the barbarian revealed the truths to Druus Akamian that harbored heart, heartbreaking suspicions of his own. So it does seem to suggest that Nora is dead. But I have to wonder, is this written before? Like, is this written now as we're reading this book or is this written later? Yeah, right. So what, 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 is the, the, what would you all think? Yeah. I, I was a little crestfallen at that part because <clears throat> part of me, though I think it's kind of, it's kind of perfect and like that Nair would be dead maybe, but it also was sort of vague at the end of the last book where, you know, it just said something like darkness and shrouded them. And Absolutely. Was, yeah. We so. never saw a body, right? Right. So there definitely, it, there, there was the possibility that he could have survived. I felt like it was like, that's the ending for him. But I also felt, you know, he was such an interesting character where like there were multiple times over the trilogy where I almost was like, his story could end here and I would be pretty satisfied with it. You know, like I remember distinctly in the warrior prophet, the scene on the beach where like Kellis is even thinking about killing him. And for whatever reason, he like feels this emotional pull to, to not. And so he spares Nair. Um, but, you know, there continue to be new interesting uh, pathways for his character. And so I, I, I was a little hopeful too, but it seems like it's the end, at least as of the first hundred pages of the judging eye. Yeah. I feel like Baker really like trained me to like hold on through the character of Nair, you know, like I, yeah, it seemed like the end for him more than a, a couple times. And, and it wouldn't have, it would have felt like you said, it would have felt okay, but it's a, uh, yeah. I don't know. I want more, but also you I'm okay with letting go. Right. He was such a great character, you know, and it, he just, again, continued to develop in really interesting ways and added a level of unpredictability to everything, <laughs> you know, like you were never sure quite like what he was going to do next, mm -hmm. um, you know, whose side he was really on other than obviously his own. And even then he sort of self-sabotages a lot too. So, you know, it was, it, again, he's so unpredictable. Um, and I'm, I'm very curious to see if someone sort of fills that role in this quadrilogy if there's like an x factor character because so far there are a lot of really interesting characters who have really interesting point of views that i'm curious to see more out of but there's no one who i'm like i have no idea what they're gonna do you know like i like so far i've like i, I feel like i have a, a handle on things i guess kellis kind of because kellis I and mean, we know what he's attempting but like the question of is he mad or not i am still unsure about So the other thing that I realized we didn't really have an answer to, or at least I didn't figure out, is why the consult wanted to go to Shime, why they were invested in the Holy War. At first, I thought it was just so a lot of people would die. And so they'd get the thing they wanted, which is to kill enough people that they can what plug off the outside. But was there some other purpose to it? Why she may specifically? Why not just have the holy war happen? That's where the Sisharan were based out of. So they wanted to eliminate them. Was kind of the idea because uh, because Moingus had discovered them was in them. It was like okay, we're sending the army to go. You know, all the Inrithi will go wipe them out, which is what happened at the end, is my understanding. I mean, I'm so sure there are a few, you know, surviving in like little shadowy corners, but I, I think generally they were like destroyed as an institution. So the consult wanted the Caesarium destroyed because Moingus was Caesarium and he had been using said institution to 
drop them and ask questions yeah. okay. and had identified the skin spies and everything yeah okay okay and the other question i had was um was it kalmamus with the prophecy that an anasurumbar will come back so what did happen to all the anasurumbar like his son was dead and he was dying so did they just die out like where were the anasurumbar supposed to come back from or was it a side thread that wasn't living there was it not a direct descendant of kalmamus that was the boy in ishwal in the prologue of the first book yeah that was one of his sons i believe it was one of his sons was that one of kalmamus's sons i'd have to reread it I, i don't know does it tell us i i guess i just assumed it was not one of now kudis like related to him um and part part <clears throat> of that is it actually comes up i i forget in what context here i think it's it came in literally thinks about it um the mystery of like like seswatha explicitly we know now had an affair with the concubine right the favorite concubine and so the whole idea of the anasurimbor line maybe ended and it's just a name you know in terms of like the literal like blood of it all and so the prophecy itself in a sense is false depending on your point of view right i mean it's interesting especially coming from this like dunyane background where blood and like genetics are so important you know they're very eugenics uh and <laughs> they you know that this like the honor surin war bloodline like potentially it seems very likely ended with kelmomus i mean i guess there are cousins and shit so i i guess it depends yeah who kelis is how that descent works i don't know if we know the bloodline exactly the the family tree mm-hmm. Well, the Anas Rimber come to the castle, right? In the first, in the prologue, because they come and they find the, the boy in the beginning of the prologue. So the they, Dune, the Dune, 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 sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah, so I guess it depends on if he's like this, you know, if he's the son of now Coyote or the, the son of, I guess it's probably too late for him to be the son of Kelmomus because mm-hmm. of the length of the, uh, war with the console so or the apocalypse was the prologue the the prologue was that during the first apocalypse or after the first apocalypse I, I think it's like at the very end maybe after yeah maybe like immediately after mm. yeah because the dunyan are also i think kind of portrayed as refugees from the apocalypse too so well i guess it could be yeah. going on mm. definitely yeah <laughs> So Anasurumbor Gandrelka, High King of Kuniuri. So what was that the place that was that the seat of the Anasurumbor or was this a branch that had like a little side kingdom or something? We do know that Ishwal is like a, a safe haven for them. It's like uh, a refuge. It, mm-hmm. It's explicitly referred to as the us in I forget if it's a thousandfold thought or in the first hundred pages here, mm-hmm. but I, I, I distinctly remember reading that like it's defined as like it's this like little fortress, you know, place for them to like hide away in. And so that's, you know, after their city fell, um, they that's where I guess the last of them went. Helm's Deep. Yeah, exactly. It's it's Helm's Deep. Exactly. <laughs> oh, Wait, okay, sorry, I'm going to jump ahead to something way in the judging eye for just a minute and then we can go about it in order. But the the name that Akamian gets from his wanderings of Seshwata's dream to figure out what he can find about the Dunyan, the name he that's told is Ishwal. And I didn't remember at the time that this was the stronghold of the secret refuge of the Kunyuric high kings i'm reading yeah. from the prologue of the first book um, but the so seshwata knew about the dunyan it seems like in some form and he knew wow. that they were going to take refuge in ishwal because that's the name that came up for them anyway oh, yeah, you're right so, i mean he might he had to have known right if for him to even think about that so yeah. that's the point yeah yeah, in the in the glossary, it mentions for two thousand years the Dunyani have hidden in the ancient fortress of Ishwal, reading their members for motor reflexes and intellectual acuity. Mm. 
So that's interesting. If Seth Watha did did know of them, um, yeah, it, and it's it's not that he wandered into knowledge of them for some reason. Like in my brain, Dunyan, sorry, Ishbal had just become the Dunyan place, and it is now, but it wasn't always. They just t- right. came to take refuge there. And given that, the fact that Seshwata knew to connect the Dunyan with these guys, with that place, is interesting. Assuming that's what knowing that name means. Uh, They're described, I remember in the prologue, is like, like everyone forgot them, you know? Mm-hmm. And so it's interesting that, I, yeah, I'm so curious about his, Seshwata's like, point of view with them like was it were they just so minor in the grand scheme of things that he just was like it was a thing he knew but he didn't think much of or Mm. I mean you would think it would be like if he knew they came to where the last Anasurian boar was that that would be something he would be interested in considering the prophecy assuming the prophecy isn't fake um because again we we've seen that dreams can change now right so I don't know how that impacts things. Um, although I did get the sense that that was a new occurrence and at the end of the thousand fold thought, it wasn't necessarily something that happened. Who knows? Well, I guess we'll find out. I think isn't a commune sort of impl- implying that there's a selectivity to the dreams that they see. They're not, they're not, they used to think that they are reliving Seishwada's life. No, I guess they don't. The, the mandate, uh, philosophers and scholars have been documenting how they don't dream about the mundane aspects of Sishwata's life. So there is some selectivity to the dream. So it he may have hidden even important things for whatever reason. Right? Like it, it, it is a little creepy <laughs> that they only see what he wants them to see from controlling <laughs> this whole what school of powerful sorcerers across time and space like that it's insane but yeah i think i think yeah that that gave me goosebumps the thought that he's uh that there there is some control obviously not like over the course of time but just whatever's in the heart it's all of it is there but they dream selectively only the events of the apocalypse until whatever happened to Akamian happens to sorcerers, and then they see the other mundane aspects of his life. You think if they have just like they get really bad food poisoning, they have nightmares of like a day says Swath that had like really <laughs> bad food poisoning. Seems not. It seems they still get to dream about dragons. And... That's probably the better, you know. Like it's it, it all becomes more of a metaphor then than them like having to relive their horrible daytime existence at night too. Like he says, like uh, the old mandate joke goes, so Seswatha don't shit. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so those were my two outstanding questions <laughs> from the previous. Like, I kept confusing myself with the answers. but And it's not, I mean, I, I haven't read far enough ahead in the prologue again, but it's not clear whether Gandralka is a descendant of Kelmomis, which would make it unclear whether he is Anasurumbur or not. Because there definitely were multiple lines, right? Like we're told a different... I, I'm blanking now too. Is Anoxophus, is he an Anasurumbur too? I, I don't think so. I think he was from other hiking, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So okay. it's not like the exact same thing as like... Okay, no, 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 never mind. Okay, cool. Hmm? What? I, I was just going to, like, again, make the Lord of the Rings comparison again, but then I realized, like, Aragorn isn't prophesied to, like, destroy Sauron. Like, that's not how the story works. Um, so, hmm. although, I mean, there is, like, a prophecy about him coming back and being king and everything, but a- anyway, not not important. <laughs> so, Kellis <laughs> is, uh, what's his name? What what name did you just say, Carl? Why can't Arathon. I remember? Arathon. Yes. What you take one of my favorite <laughs> characters in fiction and compare him to Kellis. Yeah, well, he is. He's like he's like Aragorn meets Paul Atreides turned into your worst nightmare. <laughs> just, just wait. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, I love it. Oh god. 
He's bizarro Aragorn. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And I know Steve has been menacingly telling us just wait. <laughs> just wait. <laughs> every, every time I complain to him about something getting bad, he's like, no, just wait. You haven't even seen anything yet. <laughs> We're just getting started. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Talking about oh. something that, I, I mean, yeah, it, it was already, it, these opening 100 pages were brutal in a very, like, just uh, emotionally powerful way, you know, a everything from, like, Mimara and Akamian and their, their where we up, read up to, I, I knew that's where it was going to go. I knew it. I, I, the instant she went to Akamian and was like, teach me magic, I was like, Oh God, they're gonna sleep together. Oh no, because this is the, that type of story, unfortunately. But I didn't want it to happen. I was just hoping beyond hope, um, and then it and then it did, and it was horrible. And she's an interesting character, right? Where she is like a, a firm believer in all the Kellis of it all, and you know, she's quite religious. She she's full of self loathing, but very judgmental. Yeah, I mean, she just felt like instantly. I was like, this is a very complex, interesting character um and i and i definitely felt bad for her too um you, you have to wonder if kellis sent her you know if not literally directly if that was part of his shortest path right was he was like she's how we deal with the Camian or whatever he plans for a Camian. it's like we use me mara yeah i i enjoyed the little bit of um you know, like Nair and Akamian now, you know, that exists now that Nair has infected him with the, you know, he's an honest remember, it was honest remember, and he watches, um, at, you know, always watching. And, and he's, yeah, when he accuses her of just like, he sent you. And then she's like, no, 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 he didn't. And he's like, oh yeah, he definitely sent yeah. you. You just don't know it, you know? Like <laughs> Exactly. That's that Kellis magic right there. So assuming that Kellis did send her, you would think if he wants Akamian dead, he would, kill him pretty easily right if he knows where he is Kellis he's so you have to wonder if he, if Kellis did send her what is his goal right in sending her that's the mystery because it doesn't seem like like of all people I mean I don't know like I maybe he has he could like strategic like do his computations and be like they will have a falling out and she will kill him but I don't feel like that's the case I feel like whatever his intent was for her and it came in there there's more to it than just like time to like kick him off the board you know yeah i mean with esmanet i feel like we speculated about what he wanted from her and ultimately done out oh uh, i don't know she's just smart enough to be uh, I mean, to bear children for him. And it turns out that's true somehow. Maybe he can read all the physical signs or something, but it turns out that she's managed to have one or two normal feeling children and others have gone mad over the course of the years. But um, with Akamian, I don't know, like, what does he want from him? What is left that he can possibly take from Akamian? He has the gnosis. He can teleport now. So he's transcended what Akamian knew with the gnosis so what does he want from him now if he did in fact send him i mean i i suspect that he still mm -hmm. feels he has further use for akamian you know mm -hmm. because akamian is still anti-consult and he's you know an extremely powerful ally like mm -hmm. probably more powerful than the mandate would care to admit um I mean, the way he channels Seswafa at times, like he's maybe the most powerful mandate sorcerer besides uh, Kellis himself at this point. I don't know. That's pure speculation. But it's like, you know, if Kellis wanted him dead, he'd be dead. I feel like <laughs> yeah. he's got to have it for him. <laughs> I, I wonder, too, if it's maybe like, you know, we, we know Mimara, there, there were issues trying to get her like training. And so if it's maybe even as simple as like, well, he, I, I know Kellis can, or not Kellis, I know Akamian can like train someone, you know, and like get it done and he can't, won't be able to help himself with her. So that's the path, right? And he, he's like, I, I can use Mimara, like she's a tool for me. Um, 
I'm also curious now that like we have these female magic schools, what happens if they, like a woman does the Seswatha heart bullshit of it all, you know, like how do the memories impact a woman, you know, mm. like, is there any, like what, what, you know, what's that like? Is the, is the magic any different for them? Are the dreams any different from them? Because as far as we know, right, there hasn't been any women who've been mandate, I mean, mandate school men, right? Like, yeah, I don't know if that impacts things at all. Yeah, the, I, I also that made me think of, I thought of that as soon as, you know, she wanted, I came in to teach her the Gnosis. And then I thought of Kellis and how he never did the, I can't remember what that rite is called, where they, you know, hold the mummified heart of Seswatha and and absorb some cancer or something. But um, yeah, like what, aside from imbuing people with Seswatha's dreams, like I was for some reason thinking like that was a critical part of being a mandate schoolman, but the grasping, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, but uh, uh, evidently not. Um, right. So they, they need it. So do you think Kellos knew that Akami wouldn't be able to help himself in more than one way. I mean, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. That's really creepy. Thing. I mean, it's this really is the guy who went in and immediately was like, he knew he was going to like effectively cuckold Akamian and was like, it, it, this was like he's he he's you know playing forty chess while everyone else is playing regular chess. Like it, it, it's just, it's horrible, and I hate him. I mean, he's fun to watch, but he's the worst um i on kind of the note of all of this of the mandate and dreams and kellis also rewinding a bit to like talking about you know the nature of like the honest rainbow line the bloodline specifically you would think kellis would be exposed to the possibility if not explicitly figuring out um, unless somehow he's like skirted around those specific dreams that he may not be literally descended from Kelmomus and that the honest soaring boar bloodline may have ended with now uh coyote i mean again it's unclear exactly how what the family tree looks like but like i'm curious what his thoughts are on that because he's been living with the dreams long enough now that like that wouldn't be like that seems like something that he would have a dream about you know that he would think of the uh Seswatha's affair with uh the concubine whose name i'm blanking on at the moment isn't isn't that explicitly discussed in these hundred pages that he starts on that path of doubt on whether or not now kayuri is calmomesis akamian does yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah 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 oh did you mean someone else kellis kellis oh. himself like like i feel like that would have an impact on him maybe not in like as powerful a way like i don't know that it would change his plans but so much of this image his madness right his madness in quotes that he's built up around himself that he is this son of god you know part of it is that he has this prophecy about him that he's supposed to be the weapon against the no god and the consult right that he is this from the line of anasurian board and mm -hmm. it's not taken in a way where it's like, oh, it's just the name, right? You know, this isn't like a very modern, like, oh, you know, you're adopted, whatever. Like you, you're one of them, right? Like this is like bloodline eugenics bullshit, right? And so that matters to him in his point of view. And so I feel like if he found that out, that would actually bother him is what I'm saying. And so I'm curious if he's actually encountered that dream, that possibility, or if he has, I, I don't think he would be able to ignore it. Like he's too smart. Like it, it, his arrogance would not stop him. He's, he is too calculating for that i feel like so i'm curious if he has dreamed those dreams has he been dreaming do you think he did the grasping ceremony thing to start dreaming oh i guess we don't know i i felt like well, he never did did he so i don't know he well he could have now that he's yeah. down with the mandate i guess <laughs> yeah. yeah i i don't know i guess that's unclear right if he ever did the grasping he got he learned the gnosis i think that's the extent of what happened there that we know of we don't know if he became he did anything else that would make him a mandate schoolman but it, am i 
so so he definitely didn't do the grasping in the original trilogy, but I feel like he had a vision of the apocalypse. Or, or am I misremembering? Was that strictly a Camian, or did Kellis also have a vision of the uh, of the apocalypse specific, specifically? Mm, I don't think so. Okay, so he I'm may not have done it then. I, I don't recall that. The only vision proper that I remember him having is that like when he goes into that meditative trance and he sees his circumfiction and um and some other things. But but that was it. It does then make I mean, if I was him, I would definitely do the grasping, right? Like that's a tool he could use. It it, it seems odd if he hasn't done it over the twenty years, but Maybe but not. it's in exchange for permanent nightmares, though. With right, I just May feel like he is the type of person who would think he could control his reactions, and that it would be extremely helpful for him to personally experience Seswatha's memories. You know, because that's kind of the secret behind beating the enemy. Uh, beyond mm -hmm. making a giant army of sorcerers and you know soldiers to go walk up and stomp over everything yeah now that would be interesting i'm i'm wondering though like he the fact that he's not actually god's son did not prevent him from declaring himself a warrior prophet and taking on this mantle of godhood so whatever he's doing now he's in it <laughs> so i yeah, I, I am curious to see what, if he does dream or if he finds out, let's say he's not a descendant of, uh, let's say he's not Anna Surumbur, what that would do to him. But I feel like he's on this path now to do whatever he's doing. To well, yeah, I, I agree. It wouldn't stop him, but mm -hmm. I do think it would impact him. Like, mm -hmm. I, he's definitely not someone who's like, going to take no for an answer you know like he, he's he's committed he's doing this thing he's mad right and i guess that's the biggest point to him being like mad in some sense is that he seemingly calls himself the son of god right like not just moingus like he knows moingus is literally his father but at the same time he thinks there's this divine aspect to him do you, you think know, he believes that was, do you think he I, believes that he's actually divine or i mean that was exploiting? unclear to me but the I don't know the vibe I kind of get from everything after his conversation with Moingus is that like maybe he kind of does, you know, like maybe not in the most literal sense. Like I think he knows, you know, Moingus literally sire, sired him like physically, but that there was an essence of godhood that has been infused in him. However, mm -hmm. that works, right? He does have an... Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Justin. Uh, Which is a, he has a hell of an entrance when he um, when he enters the castle. When the, the it was fun seeing the the battle from the other side, mm -hmm. and seeing seeing all the siege war, like all the warfare, like everything coming towards the, and it's just like the sense of like doom, you know. Yeah. And it's he's he's like, and everyone seems to think of him almost like as a god, as a this divine figure that can't be stopped, mm -hmm. even though they fought <laughs> he didn't <laughs> he didn't surrender but you kind of get the feeling like he knew he was gonna lose oh 100 percent. that that was the other really powerful thing for me it was like it was the mimara and akamian stuff and then that whole sequence with these characters that were you know just now introduced to that i just it was so sad reading it and i thought all the little details down to like proyas being just like so sad and old and tired and like no he's like he's been here before like he's seen this, he knows how this ends. And he tries, he tries to get the guy to just like, just just accept that you're not gonna win here, but he's too proud and he feels like too loyal to his people to just like give up and, you know, roll over. It's it's so sad, so tragic. So is, is loyalty to your people fighting and getting them a lot of them killed? Or is it saying, okay, We'll lay down. We'll lay down arms. We'll we'll join you. Is that which is more loyal? I I mean I think he should have, you know, probably surrendered. 
I think that would have been the right move, but I think he certainly felt that that was morally wrong for him to do. I don't think it was just, I mean, I think you could argue deep down it's like pride to some degree. Pride definitely played a role, but I also got the sense that the King genuinely felt like this was like his duty as King, you know? And yeah. it, it, it was that extra element of like, like duty, I think is the right word that made it so sad for me. And then of course that we see it all through his son's eyes. And then, you know, the cherry on top is callous at the end, beginning to brainwash his son. And like act so kind and you're like oh if this was anyone else i would be like wow this is actually a really like interesting like person who like actually feels bad about everything he's doing and then you know if you saw it from his perspective is like he doesn't feel he, he doesn't he's just it's just cold just blank hollow well then i think steve to to your question too like the, there's a reference to Kellis by the king as um, being from the outside or like being some kind of, you know, some kind of demon maybe, or um, so like, perhaps he truly feels, you know, perhaps he truly thinks that and that like, you know, Kellis is, is some sort of evil uh, force. So, so he feels he must stand and fight. So. Absolutely. I mean, the, the kids seemed really convinced of it. Right. And so I don't know why the, dad even with the like the added potential cynicism of years like I, I mean i don't blame him either i mean you see this guy who's like flying around like flinging lightning bolts and shit and like conquering everything and you're like yeah like that guy's a demon like you know <laughs> it's that or accepting you know that like he is like divine in some way right uh, and even though the reality is that you know he's not he's really neither probably right um but certainly from their worldview, like it makes sense. Yeah. So do you think we'll see more of uh, Sorva who's named uh, very much like Survey <laughs> for some reason, but. Wait, yeah. are, are we talking about Sorva? There, there's Sorva who is one of the daughters and then Sorwheel. Yeah, they they call him Sorva for short, um, as the oh. pet name, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. You're right. That's right. That's what his father calls him, right? Yeah. Um, I hope so, because I'm attached to him now. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. we've not seen the last of him. So the kid we saw in um, the prologue of this book, he was creepy, right? Kelmomus with a K. <laughs> And uh, pretending to love Espinette, which I mean, I guess he really does. And I definitely got the feeling he did. Yeah. Like he legitimately loves his mom. He just also is like, he's like a sociopath, like naturally too, yeah. you know. And like sociopaths can feel love. It's just mm -hmm. like the way they like interact with the world and feel things is different than you know most people. Mm. So he has a little voice telling him to drive his sister away, how to manipulate his mother into giving him more affection, which is interesting that he wants affection. And so it's like, yeah, this this kid is a very interesting character because he's like a callous who can actually feel sometimes and other times <laughs> is just going to manipulate the heck out of you, which makes him somehow extra creepy. <laughs> So this voice that he's hearing, who, who do you think it might be? The no God. <laughs> I'm kidding. I, I mean, it, it feels very similar to what Kellis has been hearing, except I don't know if he, he hears it to this extent. I, I know the voice, it's supposed to sound like an inner voice. That's how it's written. And maybe it's to lull us into this false sense of, I don't know, into thinking that, it's just his inner demons talking to him like that. But I feel like that's actually a presence. That's an actual presence that's talking to him. But yeah. That's the thing with fantasy, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you never know. It's like, is it just the character's inner voice? Like one of their inner voices? Or is this like a voice inside them? Yeah. <laughs> I definitely feel like if it is like some external force existing inside him, it's the same thing that is talking to Kellis because we know Kellis hears a voice. 
Mm. Including the no God, but possibly multiple voices. Because to me, I, yeah, I, I want I want to elaborate on that just a little bit. I feel like Kellis. To me, it seems unlikely that he's being manipulated by the no God because the no God seems senile. Like you know, I feel like the no God is not a, of a, a state of mind to manipulate people, right? So I feel like it's something else, but maybe. You know, maybe I'm just misunderstanding what the no gods deal is. Hmm. But we only saw him in that moment of being awakened, right? When he says, "Where am I? What? Uh, what? What is this place?" And whatever, whatever other questions he's asking, it's more disorientation than senile. No, at least we don't we don't know that that's how he is all the time. We only saw him at the moments of waking up. I guess, but I just feel like the no God was around long enough that like the no God wasn't awake for like a few minutes. The no God was around for a while, long enough that babies died, you know, in mass. And so despite that, Akamian only thinks of those same questions. And then when Kellis does have his visions, it's also of those questions. So I, I, to me, that's what made it seem like senility is like, I got the sense that this was a consistent, like a through line um, for the no God that like, there's a level of where he's just so far gone in whatever sense, you know, um, like maybe senile isn't the right word. I mean, there's uh, everything around the no God is really vague at this point, but I feel like it wasn't just that specific moment of waking up that we're hearing. I feel like this is a consistent thing for him, including up to his moment of death, right? Mm. Possibly, yeah. So if it is the no god, I don't know why it would be such low scale manipulation of right. uh, getting rid of the sister and whatnot. Or exactly. it could be like a fragment of some sort of evil that is talking to Kelmomus. But yeah. But the now poor I'm beetle. In... Hmm? The poor beetle. Yeah, the poor beetle. <laughs> 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 now I'm intrigued because Steve phrased the question as who is that? So it must be an external entity, right? Maybe it's him. <laughs> games with us. <laughs> Dan sometimes I, I've noticed Dan especially will like ask leading questions and sometimes just to just to mess with us. Steve's picking that up. Huh? <laughs> yeah. for you too, Steve. <laughs> you gotta it for Dan. <laughs> oh man. So. Well, I, I sorry. I, I've, unless you're going to say something more about Kamomus while we're on this topic, I do have a little more I want to uh, talk about with him. First off, Claire Dune not here, it's giving me big Alia vibes. Um, so I, I, I appreciate you know him. I love creepy children. Is what I'm getting at. Uh, I think creepy children are fun. Before we're getting on, we're talking about horror. One of my favorite horror tropes, creepy children. I love it. Um, <laughs> um, sidestepping that. Um, oh, wow. What was I going to say? I'm totally blanking. That's embarrassing after stopping everything. Um, Como is definitely a sociopath. I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with it. He's rips, ripping legs off of beetles. <laughs> You know, doesn't really feel things, but loves his mom. He's he's a sociopath. And I do wonder if he's like, if that's, I guess we'll see where he goes, you know, because the whole idea that he has like tainted Dunyan blood, right? Like Maithenet. So he's like not perfect in a sense, you know, it makes me curious to see what he could become. Although knowing the series, nothing good. Yeah. I, I like the way he's, you know, like the, you open on him, like pulling the legs off of a, an insect. And then he, he's sort of like idly toying with Esmanet's emotions all the time, right? Like he he has this like really preternatural ability to to understand and to push her buttons. And at the same time, he's emotional. So he's just, he's like very carelessly, thoughtlessly, always kind of toying with her because he can not in a malicious way just like with the beetle where he's kind of just like 
you know, blithely amused by it. And that's <laughs> really horrifying. You know, that's the sociopathic like aspect to it. Yeah. And and he's amused and he's also like trying to understand things, right? It's like this like insane intelligence combined with this just like callousness, right? Um, and beyond callousness, it is, you know, it's that like sociopathic joy out of like hurting things, you know, that like, it, that's what it takes to get like, to feel something, right? Um, like you, you read about like serial killers talking about how it like became this like urge for them because it was like the only way for them to like feel pleasure was to like do, you know, commit horrible acts. Uh, and that's sort of the vibe it gives definitely makes me very nervous about this child in contrast to his sweet half-wit brother Samar Moss who is just hugging everyone and giving everyone kisses and at first I was unclear if like is he actually a half-wit or is he just like not a super genius like his siblings but it does seem like he's like you know slow um and very sweet and he deserves so much better than the family he's in kind of wonder now on a reread if that's a reference to Samwise Gamgee because he seems a little um oh yeah that we're talking about it Sammy poor little Sammy Sam. yeah his name's Sam right that's uh, interesting what an interesting little uh, that has to be intentional right <laughs> that he's like the pure-hearted mm -hmm. oh, interesting Hmm. Is that um, so? The voice that Casmus is hearing, you know, the, how their souls were separated at childhood, apparently. Oh my God! Also, the image of these two babies just constantly staring at each other <laughs> in their <Yeah>. dreams. What? <laughs> They're doing. Yeah. I, the whole. I mean, the, for me, the, the most affecting section of this whole first hundred pages was Esmanet and her the horror of her children like yeah. how you know like how she fears so many of her children in so many different ways and then the you know the eight-limbed child with no eyes that was born and the number of surrogate mothers that bore these like like I don't, I don't know like really malformed like poor pitiful things that were drowned at birth like that stuff was pure that's like some pure psychological horror to me like the you know uh the, the mother who like fears her offspring and like absolutely uh, yeah <laughs> yeah and, oh god yeah her she really did just trade one like horrible existence for another right where but both where she's like in a sense like she's like you know like as a prostitute like for a lot of her i mean she was sold into it which is horrible but at a certain point she took agency for herself right in the same way now with kellis where like she went willingly to be Kellis's wife, kind of, but also because she felt like she had no other choice, like when she was a prostitute. So it's like she's like kind of like just upscaled, you know? I mean, she's like so much more powerful now, but it, it's sort of the same trap. It's just like a gilded cage now. It's really sad. Mm -hmm. Did did she make the choice to be with Kellis? Because she, she could have gone with a commune. I mean, that's the moment I would say that she definitely made the choice hmm. where she, I mean, again, like under pressure, one, she had Kellis's kid and two, you know, she very rightfully was afraid she would be killed. Kellis um, is, Kellis is going to be Kellis here. Yeah. yeah. So he's, he's not going to be cool with that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't blame her. Certainly. Kellis isn't about to be re cuckolded. <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, back back to what I was saying about Kel Momus and Sam Ish. I don't know the rest of his name. Sam something. Samarmas. Your, Samarmas. Um, do you think the voice in his head is whatever evil they excised out of Sam? Uh, like the because he's a pure sweet child, and some bit of Sam is also in Kel Momus making him do more evil than he might. That's what I was going to say. Okay, sorry. Um, this is on this subject. Um, so I was reading and uh, kind of like researching um, how back in the day, like in the Middle Ages, particularly in the early like Renaissance period, how people thought of like devils and like demons and Satan and where it's like kind of taken 
you know, like it was a common belief that like they're a part of life, but like they didn't appear like we view them in pop culture where they're, you know, like Satan in particular is like, you know, red horn demon, you know, pointy tail, like trident, all that shit. Like they were invisible spirits. They did not physically like represent themselves. It was something that like you would hear a voice, right? So like, obviously, you know, the common thing was thinking of like someone who's like schizophrenic and they would be, which like, if you look at schizophrenic people today, they think like demons are talking to them and like angels and shit. Um, like it's, this is a very real thing, but like people outside of them also thought that in, you know, the middle ages. And so I think it's really interesting, again, the way that he can, like Baker continues to take sort of history and like biblical mythology and like the, the, the beliefs, like taking these sort of, uh, you know, medieval Christian experiences and like playing with them. Um, it's really interesting. And I don't know, I, I'm very curious to see if Sam has like Dunyane shit going on, but he's, just like too sweet and simple to like make use of it. Like, I'm wondering if we ever get in his head, like, can he read people too? You know, like, does he have those gifts too? Or does he hear that voice? Like maybe he hears the voice too and he just doesn't care. You know, like he's like, oh, it wants me to like manipulate my half sister. No, thank you. Like I'd rather hug her instead. Maybe, maybe that's what the voice is telling him to do. Hug people. <laughs> 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 this is the way. <laughs> oh man, there was something I was gonna say and I forgot. Oh yeah, I remember. So the the whole horror with the thirteen or fourteen women who had the eight limb children who needed to be drowned in wine and salt or whatever. That also I think was a great way to tell us just how different the Dunyan must be now genetically from humans, because they can't humans can't have Dunyan children anymore but then Nathan it was born so I guess only some women can have it, it definitely feels like a supernatural thing yeah like, I can't like wrap my head around like obviously from like a fantasy perspective like this is like in a storytelling like dramatic perspective this is like a really compelling thing right that like you know monster babies and like you know that like it kills women to like have his child and things like that and that it you know but I do just feel like I mean I just can't wrap my head around like how could they be that genetically different that like this is what happens although again it makes you wonder you know there's sort of an equivalent I mean I'm not going to get too detailed but like in A Song of Ice and Fire there are like sometimes half like reptilian dragon babies born from women um who have certain blood heritage and i think you know that is playing to a very obvious like kind of trope of this idea that like there's magic in the blood right and like questions of the incest involved and all that is like fucked up and weird uh and like what's going on here where there's like yeah the children come out looking monstrous like what's going on in their bloodline where that is something that is happening here you know like what are the doing doing that is making it so that they have babies born who come out yeah like some weird monstrosity yeah and and is it just the dunian blood that's doing that or is the possession by no god i don't know if he's possessed right. but like whatever whatever internet yeah. connection he has going on with the no god is that what's doing the monstrous babies i do feel like it has to be the magic right i don't think it's mm. a Dunyan thing because i it doesn't seem like moingas had that problem like we were talking about mathanet and we don't know mm. anything about mathanet's mom i mean that's kind of a big black hole in the story right now um but it really? wouldn't su surprise me if yeah, you're right. It's like a magic thing. It's not it's not their eugenics. Mm. Yeah, that's fair. What did yeah. you all think of uh Inrilitas? Inrilitas or how pronounce it. The Spooky and sad. Mm. Yeah. Baker 
continues to uh, again infuses stories with a lot of horror elements that i appreciate just wait <laughs> <laughs> i couldn't help it sorry <laughs> Just wait. It's gonna be so fun. It's gonna be so fun. <laughs> I'm trying to think what has happened here. Not a lot happened, right? This I think one thing I did want to say was Akamian, whenever we were in his head, I feel like he has a much more distinct voice now, or maybe I didn't notice it in the first books, but no, I, I think it has changed. This sad old man that he has become who's just sort of given up on everything that he used to do, but he still has some reason to live and is pursuing vengeance in a very particular way, which Mimara thinks that he's just gone mad. And we, and I think it's unclear to the readers whether that's true or not. But every time we're in his head, the writing just got so beautiful and distinct. I think the first 100 pages were beautiful in general. Um, and... I don't know. I think the first book had a lot of these beautiful sweeping descriptions and maybe I got used to them by the time we got to the third book, but this book just felt different somehow from the previous trilogy in terms of the writing and Akamian had so many beautiful things to say in this, <laughs> in these chapters. I, I just loved his perspective whenever we got that. Esmanet also, but I think it was very distinctly Akamian, all the beautiful comparisons and the more philosophical commentary, I guess. I do feel like bouncing off that you can see in real time, not real time, literally, but like you can see Baker improve as a writer. Like I definitely feel like his prose is better. Um, it, it, everything is very like, it's like he's, not perfected but improved his voice like it still feels like the same kind of voice he had in the original trilogy but it also like it reads better and there i feel like a lot of the, the colorful turns of phrase and things like that just they, they flow that much better and i i really that was something that distinctly stood out to me just in general um not not even a k-means in particular but i just thought it was uh really remarkable yeah, I think this I think this first hundred pages is incredibly well written, some really beautiful passages infused with like some cool philosophical tidbits. Like there's the the ongoing like uh ontological questions about like, you know, what what's real, is God real, all that stuff. But I like how it's now like he's deepening it a little bit, like sor you know, sorcery is one thing, and there's the like semiotics and the semantics of sorcery and i feel like now like it's being enriched a little bit by this new sort of vision maybe the judging eye of uh memara like this this ability to see another <clears throat> another kind of truth and he even i think this is definitely a philosophical reference or a reference to um uh susser I think like there anyway, like Susser, the semiotician who wrote um about like the um how there is n there isn't a direct relationship between the a thing and you know the signifier and the signified kind of thing. And he says that you know that there's there's nothing real connecting those two, uh, that the relationship is arbitrary and Mamara's like ability to like perceive the world, he even says at one point. She sees the treeness of trees and feels like feels like the essence of things in them when she looks upon them. And um, I don't know. I feel like that's all. It's all going. You know, it all goes nicely along with the the idea of sorcery uh, overriding reality. Um, mm. And I feel like it's just kind of enriching that whole system that he's been creating. I think it's I, really cool. I totally agree. And I, I am, it made me continue to wonder, right, about like what is real and baked into the metaphysics of this world versus what is the character's particular point of view, right? I mean, this is the question of like Kellis and his madness, right? And the halos and everything. And now we have Mimara, right? And the things she sees, and not just the mark, right? But that, yeah, that she has this like 
very like literal different perspective, right? That, yeah, maybe is the judging eye. I mean, I think that's a really astute observation. Um, and it, the way she views the world was so distinct, was so different that you, you have to wonder is like, is this like a magical talent? You know, is this like, is this sort of supposed to be some like gender divide in the magic or is this just specific to Mimara or is this like, cause I think there is also a reading of it that I initially thought it was where it's like, this is her zealotry coming out, right. And her own like self-loathing and things like that. But then you like, you get into it and like with how the metaphysics of this story has played out, like, what is real, you know, like, are the things she's seen, you know, as horrifying as they can be. And I think in parts beautiful, um, but certainly to me, it was kind of scary. Um, you know, I mean, again, it's like talking about the damnation of like the sorcerers, right? Like if they are damned, like, which I'm increasingly wondering if that's true, you know, I, I kind of just like took it for granted that it wasn't. And it was just like one of their religious beliefs, but now I'm like, maybe they are like, maybe they're actually, you know, screwed, um, to be crude about it. Um, I, it, 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 I'm very curious. Yeah. To see, I guess how the philosophical ideas, like if they're actually like imbued into the metaphysics of this world and how these characters interact with their own reality is literally like, the horror story of their beliefs. I I think with Nirmara, the question I had also was whether she, whether what she's saying, there's, there's a certain aspect of interpretation to it too, right? She's seeing more brightness and she can tell whether someone is good or evil based on how she perceives them. But there is also interpretation that, you know, this brightness means that this person is good or whatever she's seeing in a Kamyan means damnation. It seems like an in instinctive conclusion that she's drawing and that may be right as well. But I am also inclined to doubt her interpretation just a little bit that I I'm not taking her conclusions at face value. Like that she can see this is very, very interesting. But what she concludes out of it, that I'm like, I'd like to see more examples of like it turning out to be true before I buy into what she's saying, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. What did uh, everyone think of the, the scalping years with the uh, shrink? I want to know, is that a historical thing? Because I feel like I've seen that in other fantasy stories now. And like. This was a real thing that happened in um, America. Manifest Destiny. Um, Native Americans would be scalped. Oh, yeah, wow. money for scalps. Hmm. That's where they. He, I mean, I don't know if it's happened elsewhere in history, but that's the first thing that came to mind reading that. Yeah, you all were talking about at some point. Um, reading uh mccarthy's blood meridian yeah um, there's, uh, yeah there's that's part of the horrific action that happens in that story so we'll be reading that next month i think oh Sorry. shit i gotta get my copy because i'm definitely getting in on that so good oh man <laughs> uh, you definitely i mean yeah again going you you see Baker's influences um, and not in a way that's like annoying, you know, cause he's always doing his own thing. He's always exploring his own ideas. Um, but I appreciate that. Like, he's also very like clear about his inspirations too. Cause I think it also lets you be, you know, this is something I think about as a writer is like how much you're in discourse with other writers and how, you know, sometimes I think it almost helps that discourse to like, kind of nod your head a little bit, uh, you know, do a little tip of the hat um, and kind of seeing them playing with like similar ideas, but then like doing his own take and exploring his own versions of it. Um, I think it deepens it is what I'm getting at. It, it like deepens the conversation. It deepens the thematics. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think to, you know, go on a little tiny bit of a tangent, but like Baker and McCarthy, you know, McCarthy was like a 
like a legitimate polymathic genius. And um, he was like a physicist and a mathematician and, uh, you know, philosopher. And like, you know, his his writing is so rich because of all of those outside interests. He's always bringing them in. You know, his last his last two books are like they're about theoretical math. And I don't understand wow. like any of that stuff. But I, it was so so in like it was such a rich uh experience and yeah baker the same thing like all of his you know all of the philosophy that he's bringing into it is i feel like it just yeah it really enriches the experience did awesome. anyone else notice varsha's face light up when you mentioned math yeah. <laughs> 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 numbers yeah <laughs> It did. I mean, Passenger and Stella Maris were already, I, I really, really badly want to read them for some reason, but I haven't gotten around to it. But this makes it, so I'll probably go pick it up immediately after this conversation. No, I won't. I'll, I'll bully Stephen to reading it with me first. <laughs> so I I have to mention uh, Theliopa, who to me was immediately a very tragic character. And that I am, um, I know if I'm in her head, I'm just gonna be like, oh, she's she's horrible. But from the outside, and I I guess specifically from Esmanet's point of view, as we really get it, I just felt so sorry for her. I mean, she she definitely read to me like, you know, she doesn't like to be touched. Like there definitely was like elements of like where she seems like autistic, and she has this like super genius aspect to her, and she just doesn't fit in with anyone at court, and like isolates herself. And she's very like, you know, she has a very flat aspect, um, very like the way she talks is very unemotional, but you know, you know, she feels things and it, she was just so sad, so sad to see her. Like, I, I think one of the things that is so talking about, like we, we talked about kind of the horror of Esmanet's, um, her relationship with her children and motherhood. Um, and also the other side of that, which is like the children's relationship with Kellis and Kellis's relationship with the children. Right. And it's just so sad to think like, I can't even imagine the, the sort of mind games Kellis plays with his kids. Right. You know, like I, I, I'm, I'm very curious to see how he interacts with them. Cause I can imagine it. It is very kind of old Testament God in terms of being like, he can be very cruel, but also like he has his moments where he can be like, very um like loving and like you know show, like because he knows how to like press their buttons right and i'm curious too i guess part of that is we've seen him in moingus right and i'm curious with his kids who have these great gifts you know in what ways can they spar in what ways is there a challenge between them right you know like kelmomis Kel um we've yet to see the older kids i i believe uh, we've only kind of heard about them through Esmanet's past, but I'm really curious to see how they all, yeah, what their relationship is like and how I'm sure it's just so tragic. I could, again, I can only imagine. It was, it was really interesting to me that the kids were born not feeling affection, like already with the Dunian characteristics that we've come to realize. The way I had pictured it so far was normal babies who are trained to have all emotion taken out of them. But it seems like they are born without any feeling and that was genetically modified over the centuries perhaps. But where I'm going with this is that the, to your point about interactions between Kellis and his children, would I feel like, well, Kelmumus hates Kellis, which is very, very interesting. He doesn't want to be around him, but Kelmumus also feels unlike I think pretty much all the other children, right? So we don't know that. We, we do, uh, I thought. Well, I mean, sir, uh, how, except how, a survey and like, all of because this. the way that they're I mean, I don't know. In, in Rilatos, his screaming definitely to me implies that he feels a lot, you know, and he doesn't know how to like process it and his dreams and his, you know, he he like it's like he's in like a brain that isn't capable of like handling his gifts you know like he has this sensory overload of his own 
Dunyane-ness. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I guess love is the right word. Maybe not feel, at least as Espinet perceives it. Sure. She only has these two children and Serve, who um, who apparently express any affection that she that is visible to her. So, yeah, I, I guess the conversations would already be interesting, apparently, because the kids knew what she was feeling. They could read her like a book always. So, yeah, it you you said manipulate the heck out of his children, which is interesting. But can they manipulate him back? Is he susceptible that's, to that? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. That's that's the thing that, and because we know Kellis can feel sometimes, right? And mm-hmm. that, and in some way, he is broken out of his. Like he's still, I think, good overall at doing the Dunyan logos shortest path of it all. But he has felt things, so we know he isn't perfect at cutting himself off in the darkness that comes before. Um, and so, yeah, I'm curious to see how they interact and like, what does he think of his kids? Like we know he has affections for Esmanet, for example, like it upsets him. He doesn't like it. He mm-hmm. like smothers it, but he feels something. And so, yeah, I, I think that whole dynamic, I'm very curious to see it. Kelmomas in particular, Maybe it's just because he's the only one of the kids' perspectives we've gotten, I believe. Um, but he, to me, read very much like, oh, I could see this being what Kellis was like as a kid. You know, like we're getting like a, 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 a point of view of like, this is what the boy was. And now you've seen the man. And, you know, I'd be curious to see how the inner, you know, again, the interplay between them. And that he hates his dad, right? That is such a curious dynamic right yeah yeah and and he thinks that Nathanette sees through him that he is basically it's really interesting like it's it's such a contradictory and paradoxical position he is in because he's apparently completed his whelming which is that that whole thing that we saw Kellis go through right to um, do the meditative trance and uh, become Dunian so to speak. So he's completed that, which means now he should be beyond feeling any emotion and be completely eliminate, have the darkness that comes before completely eliminated from what moves him. And yet, and yet he wants Esmanet's affection and he is afraid that Maithanet can see through him. <laughs> and he's he's manipulating Esmanet for more affection, which is again, such a big paradox or a contradiction there. He's using his Dunyanness to get a thing that probably no Dunyan would care about. <laughs> yeah, um, well, I mean, I guess their conditioning is partially breeding and partially nurture, right? And so mm-hmm. they're getting, you know, they've got the, the the bread portion of it, but they're not getting the, <laughs> you know, they're not looking at the flayed um, <clears throat> jaw muscles of uh, you know, human beings <laughs> to... And, and all that fun stuff. We did when we got the flashback of Kellis. We knew he he was less controlled then as a kid. Like so, we definitely know he like it was something he learned at least partially mm. over time. And so, yeah, I think we're definitely getting to see that kind of like the Dunyan out of their element uh, per se or outside of the training and like what that looks like. And it also, you know, one of the kind of thought experiment. I I, I don't know if that's the right phrase, but like. One of the aspects I appreciate about Kellis and about all of the sort of, you know, we keep kind of like, or I certainly have kept like falling on the word like sociopathic um, when talking about him and now like Calmomus and, and um, just like the, that, that lack of like feeling like empathy, I guess, and that cold manipulation. Um, but it has made me think about the ways in which we in our everyday lives sometimes like the way we like kids manipulate their parents all the time is what I'm I'm getting at. Right. So it's like the fact that he's doing it more consciously, like how different is that though, really from like a kid who's like crying because he wants his mom, you know, like it's, and, and you know, in our social interactions every day, like they're not necessarily so callous. I'm certainly hope they're not so callous. Um, which I just realized callous and callous, I don't know if that's intentional or not, but they're pretty close. 
Um, anyway, um, but like, you know, we relationships are, you don't want them to be like transactional, right? I uh, certainly not most relationships, you're healthy, you know, loving ones, but like there, there is an element of like give and take, I think. And so it, it does, it's made me, I don't know, look inward and be like, kind of analyze, um, human interactions in a way. And certainly again, I hope none of them or very few ever like cross that kind of Dunian line, but <laughs> interesting to like pull back and think about like, well, in what ways is he just more conscious of doing the things that we do day to day? You also have to, I mean, I'm guessing that the Dunian have a system for kids that, you know, they go through all this train rigorous training and, but Kellis's kids don't have that. It doesn't seem like Kellis is really even around much. So who do they have to rein them in? They're kind of just at their own left to their own devices with all these abilities. Mm. And also speaking of the I guess Kellis doesn't want to contact the Dunian again. Is he afraid they'll come for him like they sent him for his father? Because I mean, if the if he so badly wants to expand the number of children he has. Why not summon some Dunian women or something? I don't know. What is he just... That's only interesting in that there's no contact. But has there been no contact with, between him and the Dunian in the last 20 years? And does he not want to make contact? Yeah, I don't know if we know for sure yet. I'm assuming they would not be happy <laughs> with the way things are going. Hmm. Yeah. But... <laughs> I know. <clears throat> I would be curious, like, what do they think about all of this? What do they even know? You know, they maybe don't know anything. Like, for all they know, Kellis is dead. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> he should just not I, do what Moingas did and send visions in the net. <laughs> right, exactly. Like, what, what, has he told them anything? Has he reached out? Like, it, it's interesting. I'd be curious to see if we get any of his perspective again. I wonder about Callus's teleportation abilities. Can he only go within line of sight? No, he actually no. We did see him teleport over a large dist largish distance. Yep. So can he teleport to Ishwal, grab grab some children or women and come? <laughs> <laughs> you I, you know it's an interesting. What if he killed them all? I mean, what mm -hmm. if he was like, what if for whatever reason he thought like that was necessary? And he, I, I don't know that I necessarily think this happened, but I'm just throwing an idea out there because by our understanding of his teleporting magic, he probably could teleport right to Ishwal. You know, he knows where it is. He can picture it, right? And they're not powerful enough to stop him. Yeah, they don't have any sorcery, and he's like the like grand master of Gnostic sorcery. So yeah, he could probably waste all of them if he wanted to. Food for thought. I don't know. That's that man. That that's dark. Yeah. <laughs> that would be crazy if he did. <laughs> like, genocided his own people. Um, I I mean, again, I could I could see it if he's like they're a threat and they're you know I have this holy mission and so I have to stop any threat. Cause, cause again, you like wonder like, why haven't they done something? You know, why haven't they sent an agent out to check on Kellis? Right. They were anti Moingus. We know that for a fact. So yeah, well, I'm you, very curious. And am, right, am I correct in remembering that the only reason they sent Kellis after Moingus is because he sent them dreams. Yeah. Because they, he was just an exile. They were like, okay, you just can't ever come back because you're tainted. Yeah. Uh, you know, like leave and never come back. So for all they know, Kellis is still alive. Um, and Mo and presumably Moengus is dead. You know, their their presumption would be, but right. But that he would did, did they say yeah. Kellis can't come back? Yeah, because everybody else who was tainted by the dreams, like all killed themselves. Oh shit. And Kellis, yeah, and then they sent Kellis into the world. Wow. I completely missed that. What? Yeah, I missed that too. Is early. That's early. hardcore. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, they went into the, like, maze, <clears throat> the, like, lower maze of Ishual and just, like, off themselves. Wow. 
Wow. And they weren't sad about it because they're doing Yane. So. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to know what, what the hell is up with Dune Yane. I'm, I'm, I really thought we were going to find out more about them uh, in the first trilogy, but I'm curious. They continue to be a mystery. Them and the No-God are like the two big mysteries, I feel like, at this point. Yeah. that's. I'm so excited about Akamian's path because, like, he is, you know, he's on that path. Like, he's... Oh, yeah. He's, he's trying to figure it out. Yeah. <clears throat> so Steve, I'm curious, you on the board mentioned that you were really taken aback by the time jump uh, in your first time reading through. So I'm just yeah, curious about your the differences between your read throughs now and like what was it about the time jump that really like threw you off? I think last time it was because we had spent the three books kind of getting to that point and then we had this big time jump. So it felt a little jarring to have to have this big gap of time between the end of the thousandfold thought and the beginning of the judge and I, but this time I think I appreciated more the kind of the catch up we did, like the filling in the blanks that Baker has done in these first few chapters of what's happened. And I, I found it more interesting having the time jump and seeing how different the world is now. And kind of, you kind of wonder if, if, if Baker wants us to think that it's a better world because Callus is in charge or because overall, if it's a better world, is it a better, is it a better place with Callus? Because there's these schools that, you know, these um, women who are in these, they're learning magic, they're doing sorcery. They're, you know, as it has a pretty big role in ruling. And I, I think that's one of the, this is one of the reasons that I, Makes me it makes me sad when people give up on the series because of Esmenet and they don't get to see her and how much she's grown and how really powerful she is as the series goes on. So I, I like seeing her after the time jump and while her kids are of course her kids, I mean they're you know, but she's a little helpless around them because they're Danye, they're half Danye, but she she does have she is respected for the most part, and she has a pretty big role. And I, I liked seeing that it's not just conquering, it's also ruling after, even 20 years after, or however many years. So I think that all that's really interesting. I think it's more interesting than if we would have had like another book in between to tell us this whole story. I think catching up is more interesting. But yeah, so th this time isn't as jarring for me, the time jump. And I wasn't, I didn't expect it. I didn't know that it, there was a time jump when I first read it. So it was a little like, what's going on? But that makes sense. I definitely I suspect just like fully in this first of, of this quadrilogy and throwing this out here, uh, that I'm going to like the, this quadrilogy more than I like the trilogy uh, for two reasons. Really, actually, it's one reason. Well, I don't know, we'll see. Uh, one, we're gonna really, get into, actually it's half of these. <laughs> it seems like we're gonna get into all the really crazy fantasy shit, which I'm here for. You know, like the old lore. You know, that kind of was in the background, like the consult. You know, uh, I really enjoyed the historical, like holy war elements, but I also felt like the politics weren't necessarily as well drawn and complex as I wanted. Or, or I guess I should say, a lot of the players didn't feel like it was Kellis's story. Right. We were watching Callus take it over. So it didn't I didn't I wasn't necessarily that invested in everything going on around him um, politically. And now. I still think it's probably Kellis's story, even though we've like barely seen him, which was true, actually, to the first book, too. We only saw him in like the prologue and then he disappeared for like 200 pages. But um, it's a family drama now. And I'm always here for a family drama. I'm very open about that. Uh, I that it was you, you could call the first trilogy a lot of things, but it was definitely not a family. I mean, there was the father son element of Kelsey Moingas, but like that's not really, you know. But now it's like this family is at the center of things, and I am here to see them be dysfunctional and messy. It's my favorite thing. I would have never guessed that after reading your book. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I've uh, kind of, you know, I mean, I work working in entertainment, like trying to establish a career as a screenwriter. 
sorry for this tangent. Um, but uh, I, you know, you have to like pitch yourself, right? And so I like try to pitch myself oftentimes now as like, I write like nerdy genre shit. That's all like a family <laughs> drama at its heart. I can it's, see that. Yeah. It's the shit I eat, eat up. I love it. You could you could argue that the first series had some family drama in the survey as minute callous triangle thing and a commune. And those are my favorite parts, honestly. So you know, if if this is going to center around the It's the generational aspect that's mm-hmm. missing for me. It's like mm. you need the multiple generations for it to mm. like hit that point. Oh, interesting. Okay. Fair. Fair. <laughs> um can I okay, so on that on the family tip, uh does anybody here besides me think that Moengus or, or does everybody think this? Think that Moengus is actually Nair's kid? Yeah, 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 totally. Okay. Wait, Mo- yes, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I I think it was pretty clear from the first series that because by the time she was pregnant. She had incept with Kellis. Um, yeah, so. okay. She she was hallucinating. She was. Mm-hmm. She was like almost imagining that Nair yeah. was Kellis, but it, it was definitely Nair. Kellis waited for a long time before he actually slept with her. So I think that's a really, like, that's a really cool, like, seed, for lack of a better word, uh, that, like, you know, in... In, in Moengus is like, you know, the, the promise that he'll eventually find out that he's not Kellis, Kellis's heir and that he has like Skelvendi blood in him. And, you know, like maybe like Nair will like be back in some way. You know? <laughs> hmm. that's Speaking of, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just saying that's interesting. I am. I, yeah, I'm totally on board with that. Yeah, I, I, I was wondering what the heck happened to the Sylvendi in all of this. The Aspect Emperor is the emperor of, like, what are the lands that he now rules? And are the Sylvendi's lands within the scope of his empire? We have a map. I did not look at it. <laughs> yeah, they're well within. <clears throat> I mean, they're a little bit north, but... Yeah. Oops. Sorry. Where? Are oh they? yeah, the Steppy is within Step Steppy. How do you how do you say it? The New Empire. But there's no border. Is it all of it? Is the whole thing the Empire? In which case, the Step, the Ju Giunati Step, is in the Empire. Yeah. So is he now ruling the Sylvendi? Is that a is that what's going on? I would guess. Interesting. Uh, yeah. I mean, I would be shocked. There were so few of them left, and they were like so broken up that it feels like an easy win for Kellis. That's true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, and and I made the mistake of thinking all Sylvendi are like Nair. Ne- they are not. They. <laughs> <laughs> Nair has been moingusified. Um, yeah. Is there anything else to discuss in these first four chapters? Mm-hmm. In which case, quote Steve, please. <laughs> Pretty please. <laughs> I didn't have that many this week. Um, I only had two. On page 98, only by knowing, and this kind of ties into the darkness that comes before, uh, only by knowing what a man has been can you hope to say what he will be. Mm. And on page 101, I have to remind, have to remind myself of this sometimes, there's no knowledge in the shadow of hate. Nice. I like that. <clears throat> I had one pretty Akamian line that well, I had several, but I'll only do a couple so I don't bore all of you with all the quotes. Um, yeah. Oh, man. I don't know. Someone else do quotes while I look for the ones I highlighted. I I underlined a couple, I think, from that same section uh, that Steve, you were just quoting from, where Mamara is talking about uh, Akamian, and she says, 
the way people speak is a bound thing as far from free as a slave or a horse place uh, place binds it occasion occasion binds it but other people rule it most of all the shadow of name lies hidden in every word spoken which is some you know wow. that comes before shit <laughs> i like that oh i found one um this is when he has the dream of uh, Seshwata sleeping with the concubine. Not all facts are equal. Some hang like leaves from the branching of more substantial truths. Others stand like trunks, shouldering the beliefs of entire nations. And a few, a desperate few, are seeds. <clears throat> so this isn't like a deep quote, but I think it's really interesting, potentially on a thematic and like a foreshadowing level. Mm -hmm. um, that the opening of chapter one, the epigraph, uh, upon the high wall, the husband slept while round the hearth, the women wept and fugitives murmured tales of woe of greater cities lost to Mog Haro. And this is from the sagas, right? Mm -hmm. I think this is interestingly placed because the whole chapter is about Kelsey's forces going and overrunning a city. And so I think it's a very intentional parallel, right? Mm -hmm. Lining him up with the no God. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a great point. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, and with the possession, possible possession. I don't know why I'm calling it possession, but like possible possession <laughs> of Kellis by the no god. Hmm. That's what I'm saying is I think there's a potentially that's alluding to their connection and that there being a more distinct. I mean, I think thematically it's certainly there that like the idea of this like conquering force, you know, but also, yeah, the possession or the, their connection, whatever that looks like, whatever that is, however it's defined. Also, it makes you wonder, right? What is the no God, right? If, if in some way Kellis is a parallel figure in any way, as sort of this almost like force of nature, right? You know, was the no God a man at one point? What, what was his deal? You know, what's his story? Hmm. Yeah, that is interesting. I have one more. Trying to forget, trying not to hear when your deepest ears were continually pricked was almost as difficult as trying to hate away love. Hmm. This is page 47. I like that yeah. one. It's a good mm -hmm. one. <laughs> yeah, it's very beautiful. I'm very much looking forward to more of this. I am a little happy that The Great Ordeal is the third book in the series for two reasons. One, that the war that Kellis is leading up to is maybe not the end game there's more after that um and the other that maybe will be the battle scenes will be toned down a little bit <laughs> on <Yeah. the> <laughs> i'm curious what white luck warrior means too going off the titles yeah uh, yeah i mean i suspect it has to do with kellis because a lot of the titles seem to but what the hell is the white luck? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, intriguing too that the last book is the unholy console. Like, what does that yeah. mean? I don't, that's that's such a delicious promise. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't. So, just a quick question to the group before we leave. So, when you read series that are finished. And you know the titles ahead and you see names early on. It's that makes it really interesting for me. Like with Malazan, for instance, the Cripple God is the tenth book. But we find out, I think the term is first used, at least the one when I noticed in the third book. Right. So uh we know that the last book is called The Unholy Consult, but we know what the consult are within the first book. So like I feel like we get a sense of where we are going when we know these titles, sort of, but 
uh, yeah, it just makes it very interesting for me. Like, does that change anything for you guys knowing the titles ahead for finished series? It excites me. I mean, I think it's it is. It's like a promise, you know. Like, this is what we're building up to. Um, yeah, it's, it builds mm -hmm. excitement. Yeah, yeah. It fuels my totally irresponsible speculation. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, I mean, you know, again, like referencing, you know, A Song of Ice and Fire again, like the next book, if it ever comes out, the fact that it's called Winds of Winter, like that makes me excited. And the, <laughs> the last book is called A Dream of Spring, if it ever comes out, is, you know, like that also makes me excited because I'm like, oh, they're not all going to die. Like there's some, it's it's a dream of mm. spring, but still like that's better than like uh, the corpses in winter, you know, <laughs> like. I, I, I'll, I'll take it. Um, so it makes me hopeful. It makes me willing to hope as opposed to this series ending with the unholy consult. I'm like, all right, here we go. <laughs> yeah. Is it, is it also slightly that, yeah, maybe, maybe it's not telling us that, that you don't really know what's going on with the consult until the very end, what their end game is. But... Unless... I mean, I feel like we have a decent idea of what's going on with them. Yeah, it's the no god. I feel like that I'm really unclear on. Although I guess again, everything we've been told has just been hasn't been from their like mouths. Well, kind mm -hmm. of. They do allude, like they talk about like mass murder and like <laughs> cleansing the world and shit. So I don't know. Yeah. Oh, the other thing that was uh, dropped in the what came before section was that. Uh, I don't know if this was mentioned in the book explicitly, but apparently the the consult were on their way to resurrecting the no god within twenty years. That yes, yeah, that was huge. Yes, and he started twenty years later. I don't think it was mentioned. Like I don't think it was part of Moengus's conversation. If it was, I completely missed it. But in this recap, we find out that they were on their <laughs> they were on track to <laughs> meet some goals twenty years later. <laughs> You're so right. Mm -hmm. So Gellis is headed to Golgotarot, where do you think that the no god is being resurrected as they march? <laughs> Steve knows, <laughs> but won't share. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I do. I, mm -hmm. It occurs to me as we're talking about this the whole plan of like conquering the world to fight them off. I feel like a lot of people are going to die in that process and if that's their end goal the consults you're kind of helping them and inverting i mean like if they just need to wipe people out to like i guess there's a balance of like killing hundreds of thousands to save untold millions i don't know i don't know where the like the line in the sand is for summoning the no god but or not even summoning the no god it's for uh breaking the boundary right or making a boundary between mm -hmm the whatever the outside and era yeah yeah, yeah. I think... Ke Sorry. oh i was gonna yeah. say Kellis is not the guy i want in charge of the the trolley problem for the entire <laughs> world <Yeah. laughs> no <laughs> oh that's hilarious <laughs> there's um yeah, so Akamian has a, that's why we stopped, right, this section, that Memara tells him that Kellis is headed to Golgotarot, and Akamian, I think, I, I read it as a moment of terror, has a moment of terror, that Kellis is headed there. So, ooh, is this where Kellis becomes the no-god? Anyway, um, mindless speculation. <laughs> aside um, let's do outros i guess unless was there anything anyone wanted to final theories yes if oh, anyone yeah. has final theories final speculation i'm i'm gonna bring back my old one that i think i brought up maybe in our very first chat i think the uh oh my god i want to say the horn that's not right oh you know what i said it's a dragon thing and then i found out dragons were made so maybe it isn't a dragon tusk i don't know it's the tusk of some giant monster and I, I hope we find out what that's it all right theories <laughs> <laughs> giant <-er> mastodons 
Yes, okay. even bigger mastodons. <laughs> okay, so I'll I'll do my crazy theory, I guess. Then the Kellis goes to Golgotha Rod and becomes the no god. I dig it. Mm. <laughs> I love that. Um, I remember from reading the in the appendices that the Heron Spear was lost when the Skilvendi raided some Kuniric kingdom. Um and has been lost for like 800 years or something like that. So uh, I don't know. I don't have any like wild speculation about it, but other than that, it will be found. And uh, I don't know. For yeah. sure. <laughs> I support yeah. that theory. It's got to come back. They've talked about it too much. Bring the laser gun back. Like, where <laughs> is it? I'm so curious where they're going to find it. You know? <laughs> oh, that's what you guys were calling laser gun last time. I had no idea. <laughs> I only... they're, well, they're weapons I... of light they're like called weapons of light mm -hmm. and, and things like that we know they have like far future like sci-fi tech mm -hmm. and like when you think about it, you're like oh it's like it's like shooting or maybe it extends into like a light blade i don't know mm -hmm. but like it's sci-fi <laughs> shit yeah that that makes sense mm -hmm. cool so outros then we'll start with justin uh I'm Justin. Um, I am sort of on page chewing and not really on social media and uh, and sometimes on midnightmovietrain.com. I'm Carl. You can find me on social media if you really want to at Carl D. Albert most places, I think, and on page chewing where I would rather you find me. Uh, and you can find my book, Truth of Crowns. Again, just look it up. <laughs> And I'm Steve, and I'm high on cold meds currently. But um, yeah, so you can find me on pagetuning.com, join our forums if you'd like to chat with us, and um, you know, come by and say hello. And we will we will be talking with Carl here soon about his book and getting into the nitty gritty and all of the tragedy and sadness that comes along with it. Yeah, I, I just added one to my list of questions for Carl from today's conversation. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, and you can find me on the page chewing forum as well, hanging out, uh, you know, asking people to join read alongs and maybe playing <laughs> losing money at blackjack. <laughs> like, <laughs> not money, points, just points. <laughs> Every time I say money and then I have I self correct to say points, <laughs> the stakes are lower than I'm making them in my head. <laughs> 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 But if you'd like to join us for these discussions, either here on this group or on the forum, consider checking out the Patreon forum. Next week, we're going to be talking about chapters five through eight. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you in about a week. Bye.